Hello, welcome back. This is a big long video of the week. Um, uh, I'm calling it what the hell was that? It's a see, it's, a, it's an idea of it as uh, a director who usually makes sane films, makes kind of normal films, makes someone that's felt kind of film like, what the hell are they thinking? Like, how do you think this was going to work, or why did they do it? Or that was strange. You know, it has to be, I'm not doing something like David Lynch or Tim Burton or Cronenberg who make strange films generally or films I've seen as strange. It's like, for them making a strange film isn't out of the ordinary. This is like much more like conventional mainstream directors making a strange, weird, sometimes perverted, sometimes bad film. Some of them are actually good, but you still have to wonder what the hell were they thinking when they're making this? How do they ever think this might work for our general audience? you know, or this might work as a good film. It's that kind of thing, it's like, where I think the director may have gone a bit insane making it, and his other films maybe not have been as far out as that, okay. So a lot of these films I really like, so I'm not judging anybody, right? There's a few, if I don't like the film I'll see it, but usually most of these I do like, so it's, Sometimes I like them despite themselves. <clears throat> okay, we're starting with the film that inspired this <laughs> video, which is Prophecy by John Frankenheimer. Now, as you may have known if you watched my videos, I like John from, from Frankenheimer a lot. He's a really good director, but he's also done some trash. He he was the director of um, The Island of Dr. Moreau, the uh, disastrous film with Marlon Brando and Val Kilmer. And normally that would be the one that would, in any career, that should be the one that's like, the what the hell were they thinking movie. There's like, there should be no dispute over that being his what the hell were they thinking movie. But he went one further in his late 70s. He made Prophecy. Prophecy is actually weirder and more wayward than a film starring Marlon Brando and he didn't want to be there. That's how bizarre this film is. Um, it's an environmental film. The whole idea is these um, um, paper cutters who cut down the trees and turn them into paper have been using this chemical that's banned that floats down the river and it infects these animals and turns them, mutates them, turns them rabid, and they start attacking these people and killing them. And that's the description of the plot. And the heroes are. Uh, a man and wife, uh, they're, they're both, uh, Robert Foxworth and Tyler Shire, they're both going to um, investigate. Oh, he is, he has his job, he's an environmental guy. She's a violinist who's, who's pregnant, but she don't want to tell him because he's anti, bringing her children to this awful, awful world type of thing. Very 70s. <laughs> and it's just uber cheesy because any time you have, it's done by studios, any time you have any stars, everything looks like it's been shot on a set. Even when they're shooting outside, it feels like it's been lit to an inch of his life. It just feels so old fashioned. Which is weird from Frankenheimer who used to do a lot of really interesting films and kept it, kept the realism up. And this point everything looks fake, even when they're out in the, in the, in the forest which is shot, it's meant to be in Maine but it's shot somewhere else. It's not mean, obviously not mean. And everything just looks fake. They've, they're dealing with Indians, none of whom are played, well most of whom are not played by Indians. The leader is played by Amanda Santi, who just looks in no way Indian. And you're watching it, are you kidding me? And you're watching them fight against the people cutting down the trees and this is their land and all the rest of it. So it's an environmental message just shoved down your throat. And it's obvious who the villains are and who the good guys are and that's so obvious that it's embarrassing for a Frankenheimer film because it's usually a bit more nuanced than this but this is just like we white men bad everyone else good and it's like it's that level of intelligence and, kid, and the lead character is such a get to you you want to be inside the villains because he's so, it's that smug white guy in the centre of this story about Indians who are having their land destroyed. But you have to follow the white guy and it's like, mm. and the Indians played by non-Indian and it's like, Jesus. 
This is weird. And then the monsters show up, and the monsters are horribly done. And it just gets weird because they can't run. Because they're, they're like um, big, like designed to be giant bears and things, and they can't move. So you have to, they run rails that are moving forward, and you can tell they run rails. So there's no fear. <laughs> and the film's cut up so weirdly that whenever there's an action scene, like the cause and effect just seems to be disconnected. Plus, there's always these animals moving in rails that aren't creepy at all, they're just funny. And it's absolutely awful. And there's scenes where the least the feels the whole sequence been cut out in between these certain scenes because the first like hour is set up and then the last half hour is the action. And it feels like it should be the other way around, but they couldn't afford it. And there's always these gaps of where someone goes and does something where in any other film there would be an action scene, but there's not because they couldn't afford it. And it's and it just winds down to stupidity. But mainly these um, infected animals look so funny and look so wrong and it's like what the hell was this couldn't you have shot these things properly and what's really weird is every so often Frank Hember shows his talent by having a couple of scenes where it's always made by a guy with talent like there's a bit in the beginning where they're going through, you're seeing these um, people with um, flashlights on their, on their helmets and um, it's a great imagery, there's a bit where everyone's underground and they're talking and it's shot really quick and it's like, oh that's a really good scene. And then the rest of the film is not that, the rest of the film is full of scenes that are extended way beyond where they should be. The, some scenes should be like two lines and it's like, feels like five minutes long. The whole film is made by someone who seems to have lost all their talent. And it's like, what the hell is this? It's like, really, what the hell is it? Because this was made just after Frankenheimer made like French Connection 2 and Black Sunday, which are both good, competent films. And it's like, I had an alcohol problem, and this film looks like someone who had an alcohol problem. Because there's, there's massive gaps in it, and it's just so weird, because none of the things are scary, but every so often they're shot with atmosphere. But then you get these like really fake looking monsters, and it's like, oh my god, who was watching this? Who was actually behind it? Because, um, there's a film I'm covering later on in the week called Phase 4 which had probably less money spent on it and a much more difficult to pull off idea behind it and it was so much better than this because it was done with intelligence and this one is just done like I don't care just we'll just shoot this stuff and hope for the best and there's, there's just so many scenes that are done badly there's so many scenes that look like they're shot in a bat lot or they're just shot as if a TV episode and then there's nice scenes and then there's that have got some imagination and suddenly there's the back to terrible scenes and it's just this one is probably the most incompetent and it actually makes Island of Dr. Moreau look good that's how bad it is it's just it's ultimately what the hell were you thinking type of movie it's like what, what happened? <laughs> okay we're going to go on now to The Keep Michael Mann's The Keep like uh I think the ultimate, what the hell was that? But unlike Prophecy, this one's actually made by a director who does know what they're doing most of the time. It's just that they've they've gone outside their skill level, which is Michael Mann does realistic films, but he does realistic films with fantastical stylizations within the... using architecture, using lighting, things like that. He's not a realistic director, but he uses realism as a base, and, he, and he's very interested in and like expressionism so he does an expressionistic horror movie and horror's not his thing and you can tell because there's so many sequences that are not his thing it's like he's using lights and weird imagery to suggest suggest something that's not scary but it's really interesting I mean you've got lots of really good actors like Gabriel Byrne, Ian McKellen and Scott Glenn showing up and they're almost like models within the frame I mean, it's, it's like Ian McKellen when he was still learning to act in film where he was a theatre actor and he hadn't made the move over yet to be a, a film actor to relax on film he was still kind of stiff and thinking it through a bit too much when you're watching him but there's still some nice moments for him because he's a good actor despite that and Gabriel Byrne's good as a kind of villain Judge and Prof now is good as a good Nazi who doesn't believe in the Nazi he's a German but he doesn't believe in the Nazis and he just, he sees all this as a metaphor for everything's wrong with Germany, which is this 
they have started to believe in weird stuff that is corrupting their souls. And the whole thing is a, corrupt, is a metaphor for fascism, or this keep, they're going to keep this, with this ancient evils in it, and they have to use this Jewish um, professor to try and interpret all, all the old writings. And no, that's Steve McKellen, and he gets some power by being affected by the keep. And it takes him too long to realise that the power is not good, it's evil. And Scott Glenn plays a guy who comes to destroy the monster at the end. It's weird as hell, it's wonderful though, it's just beautifully done and it's... But it's, it's a sign that Michael Mann should not be making like supernatural horror films. He just doesn't get the basic stuff you need to do to make it work. But he's wonderful anyway, it's, a, it's a one of those weird messes that's gorgeous. But I heard Michael Mann does not like this film. But as a Michael Mann fan, this is really something. This is it's it's the best of the what the hell was this? Well, prophecy is the best in a different way. Both prophecy is the best and what the hell was this? I can't believe I'm watching this, but I want to watch it again. The keeps much more like what the hell was this? This feels like people were tripping out making a film. And I'm just, I, <laughs> that's something I quite like in a film. Okay, uh, Next, um, we've got Capable, Paul Schrader, another director who has a more respectable career than um, genre directors generally do, and he tends to make like s serious films that are introspective and are about faith and loss of direction, humanity, and loss of meaning for a person, and romantic urges that go wrong. This one is full of all that. <laughs> But it's in a horror situation where it's a remake of cat people from the 40s and they've frozen lots of sex, lots of colour schemes, lots of weird... He made this just after American Gigolo and just before Mishima. So, there's lo so this was not a director who was losing a talent around. This was a director who just went weird and a really weird idea and he just went for it and made this film that does not work as a horror film like, at all. It's not scary at all. It's wonderfully weird, and Malcolm McDowell plays this guy. I mean, um, he's not the lead, but he may as well be because he's the. Natasha Kinski plays the lead, and she's kind of bland. John Heard and plays a lover who's trying to work out who she is, who's why why she's so scared of sex, why is she paranoid about turning a panther. But Natasha Kinski is not really that. If you've seen the original. That's much better dealing with psychology of that character. The remake's all about the weird weirdness of all the weird perverseness. Like uh, Malcolm Dell plays a brother who thinks he has to sleep with her as the only way of sex that we, we, so they won't turn into a beast. It's full of weirdness because it's maybe a bit about psychology but it's also, it also shows that this stuff is real. And there's all these weird tribal stuff and it's it's just a strange film and there's the s and elements to it and it's just strange. It's like so they just said you had a hit, go and meet this film and don't bother us then they saw the film and it's like what the hell was that? I love this film. <laughs> it's just bizarre as hell. And it's bizarre in the way only Schrader can make. Just the same way as the keep is bizarre in the way Michael Mann could make. It's like, it's like the Eds have been let loose and no one said maybe that's not a good idea. Or they've said it way too late because the director has gone completely nuts. Those fair films I love, just like the, the ultimate. What the hell is this? You always feel the, the, always, the funny thing is Michael Mann and uh, Schrader both went on to make one of their best films after these weirdness. Like Michael Mann made Manhunter next, and Schrader made uh, Mishima. So it wasn't like they lost their edge or anything. It was just like they went off on weird tangents while they had a lot, while their talent was at its peak, <laughs> which makes he's wonderful. And now we have the Heritage with John Berman. I've done videos on The Heretic before. Um, anyone who's seen my channel probably knows I love The Heretic. I've probably mentioned it a few times I'm a big fan of The Heretic. Uh, I'll, I won't go on too long with The Heretic. I just love it. It's wonderfully weird and strange and Berman just went off in one. Making a secret of a film we didn't like, which was The Exorcist. Making it really weird and hard to understand. With a script that doesn't really work as a plot, but works wonderfully as an idea of I wonder what would happen if this happened and that happened and it's just this weird, really weird set of ideas that don't have any foundation in any kind of plot that you want to follow 
but a wonderful one it's just like you're watching just the two hours on acid trip it's just great and, and Richard Burton taking it all very seriously and being this Richard Burton voice and everyone else giving these weird performances that are not quite right but are kind of interesting it's, it's just great fun I mean um, I have a ball watching it it's just I, I, I actually have the both uh, both in the Exorcist Anthology plus I've got the Shape Factory edition so I've actually got more than one copy of Exorcist and Blu-ray Exodus 2 Blu-ray I feel no shame right um, next we're going to go uh, for Bonfire the Vanities Brian De Palma's one now Brian De Palma's done a couple of weird films like Mission to Mars that wasn't well received I've definitely done Mission to Mars but Bonfire the Vanities is the ultimate what the hell is that because it's like it's not very good but it's weirdly interesting for a failure because it was made with a studio beaming down his neck to be as adaptation of his book that would never work as a film and it's a f fascinating mess because it, it would never it never really work it was miscast but the Palm had those weird ideas that kind of worked despite the script like he would like he made like the rich area feel very paranoid and very much influenced by Orson Welles and the trial film Orson Welles made and but, but then he felt it with these kind of cartoon characters who didn't quite work. The view of the poor seemed weird and very Hollywoody. Like he wasn't in full control of that. And the plot meanders all over the place. And Bruce Willis turns up, play a guy who should have English but now he's American. And he narrates it. And it's just a mess. It's a total mess. But it's a fascinating mess. It's one of those messes that fascinate me. Like I'm trying, so I'm like, I like the book a lot, and but the book's very different from this, and it's just weird. But it's a bizarrely watchable mess. It's like Tom Hanks plays the lead, and he's very miscast, but he's trying his best, and it's quite interesting to watch that as well. Melanie Griffith plays a total slut, and she's really boring in it, and it's just way too old for that part. And none of the jokes work and nothing kind of works but visually there's tons of really cool shots and there's some nice like jokes about the media and how the media is manipulating everything just to get their sales and stuff so there's nice moments in it but it just doesn't work because they can't connect the um, the plot to what De Palma's interested in and it's just this weird mess of a director who was kind of right for the project if they did any guts but it doesn't quite work but I still find it fascinating. It's a real what the hell is this? As an it's a total mess. But again, it's a it's a film. The Pamba then jumped back and he made Raising Kane and Carlitos Way and Mission Impossible right after this. And then before he made in touch towards and Casual War. So it wasn't like he was made it in a in a run of failures, he was made it in a run of good films. <laughs> Which makes it even weirder. It's like what the hell happened? I mean, Raising Cane's a what the hell is this as well, but it's a fun what the hell is this because it's very intentionally over the top. There's other what the hell is this Palmer's like the Fury as well. But I thought I'd cover Bonfather Vantes and no one else ever talks about it. I don't think he'd do a video on it. I think it's just one of those weird what the hell is this. It's worth seeing to see a director just go wrong. But he didn't go as wrong as Spielberg did with his what the hell is this movie. I'm going to cover quite a lot of the movie brats in this one, by the way. Uh, Spielberg, a lot of people would go for 1941, but I like 1941. I don't think it's that kind of movie. I think it's a, it's a little off, but I think it's a really wonderful film. But Hook, on the other hand, is an ultimate what the hell is this? This is actually, in my opinion, much worse than Born Father Vanities. And I don't think Spielberg would disagree, because Spielberg is has made comments suggest he did not like this film <laughs> like he missed and it's a really weird film and it's really boring and it doesn't work in any possible way the only thing that works in it at all is Dustin Hoffman is Hook because he's camping up like crazy with Bob Hoskins those are the only scenes that are worth watching the rest of it is the idea of what if Peter Pan grew up which is dumb there's been a lot of bad Peter Pan movies. I mean, there's this, there's Pan, which was released a couple of years ago. There was a good one P.G. Hogan did in the early 2000s. But this is terrible. This is so sentimental and it's full of all these weird things. And there's Robin Williams at its 
absolute worst. He is so bad in this film and so wretchedly awful in this film and so sentimental and shop smokes in this film. I'm not that big of a movies fan actually. I think he's doing certain things but I don't love his stuff enough to miss the bad ones too and say that was wrong, that was wrong, that was wrong. You know what I mean? It's like because he's dead then there's a lot of sentimentality towards him at the moment and it's like he made a lot of shit, <laughs> you know, and this is the, the shittiest. This is terrible. It, it was just so awful. It's, it's hard to... I saw this in the cinema and even then I was watching it, I was kind of enjoying a bit, kind of enjoying a way you watch, watch a train wreck. It's like, what are they thinking? What are they doing? There's just so many scenes. It just goes to Neverland. It just gets tedious because it's all in a set and it, it's obvious a set and all the Lost Boys in it are terrible and they all, you all hate them all. And Robin Williams is terrible and it's just this, there's no magic to it. It's one of those, what the hell is this? It's like, what was Spielberg thinking? Because this, it was kind of in a weird period before he could just come back with Jurassic Park and Sunder's List. This was kind of the, he'd done Always, which I really like Always actually. He'd done Last Crusade, which I'm not that big a fan of. But before that he'd done Empire of the Sun, so it was this kind of weird period where he was, he was kind of, I think he was trying to redefine himself, but it hadn't really worked out. We wanted, we had, I think this one was a kind of lost confidence movie. I'll do this, this should be easy, and it turned out to be the worst possible move because it was just awful. It was just, this is a, a prophecy element of what the hell is this? Is like, what the hell were they thinking? <laughs> you know, and when I say someone's worse than Bonfire Advantage, that's not good. <laughs> but it's not a what the hell is this movie. Um. Next is Showgirls. I might as well go to Verhoeven, who's a big fan of Verhoeven. Verhoeven, this one, he was making a what the hell is this movie about strippers in, in Las Vegas. And he was, trying, he was trying to show how cynical the world was of them. Um, he was using strippers in Las Vegas as a metaphor for capitalism and the movie industry and that whole idea of how far you have to sell your soul to get ahead in any industry. And he was trying to do that and he was really cynical and it's kind of funny you see the cynicism going through this film but he's doing it with one of the worst scripts I've ever written. A script that is actually worse than the script of Hook. So we're going way down of directors making bad films and bad scripts. But this one you can't do much with. This is a terrible script. It's like unsympathetic characters, meandering plot and then Verhoeven's been as cynical as hell and it's hilarious because all these actors taking it seriously. The only one who isn't is Gina Gershon who is camping up like crazy. And she's the one that survived best because she knew what film she was in. Everyone else gets destroyed in this film because it's so wrong but it's wonderfully wrong. I mean this is, oh, oh, what the hell is this I can really enjoy but it's so wrong. <laughs> it's. It's really bad, but it's Verhoeven's cynicism throughout. Even as the scripts try and make you like this character, and Verhoeven can't, obviously can't stand her. <laughs> and he's taking the mic out the whole time, and he's having her overact like crazy. It's a weird tension in the film, this is why I kind of like it. It's this utterly cynical view of the world, mixed with this person trying to have this fake, the writer's trying to have this fake, optimistic view of the world. Oh, she can get through this, she can. And Surviving this world and Verhoeven's like, nope, she's a slut. <laughs> she's terrible. She's a horrible character. It's like the writer and director have no sympathy for each other's opinions. And it's just wonderfully off this film. But it's a wonderfully misanthropic. Then Verhoeven would go on to make the great Starship Troopers, which took this idea of a bland lead or a bland set of leads to a whole new level of satire. So this film is like a kind of satire of a get make, get good. Film, but he's trying to get a satire of one of the worst scripts who doesn't realise, worst scripts ever made, ever written, who doesn't realise it's a satire. It doesn't quite work, but it was a setup for something really wonderful. Next. And Verhoeven's found his footing since then, so it's fine. And he seems to have a sense of humour about how bad this one went wrong. Okay, uh, next is Starship, or Star Trek The Motion Picture by Robert Wise. The reason I bring this up is it was maybe the start of a franchise that did start it, but it was such a weird film. It's a slow paced, weird film with a weird idea in the centre. It's like, didn't Wise just say to them, look, this script is odd. 
because it's a really odd script and it's really strange and it's, it's wonderful. I adore Star Trek The Motion Picture. I have no irony, no nothing against it. I adore Star Trek The Motion Picture. You know, there are good Star Trek films like Rafa Khan and First Contact that actually are objectively good. This one's a bit of a mess, but it's a hell of a lot better than Star Trek V, which isn't on this list only because Shatner only did one film. Um, but this one is like, it's about them trying to find this godlike creature, the centre of the storm, it turns out to be a Voyager spaceship which was lost in a pure black hole or something. Makes no sense, that joint explanation of what happened makes no sense. But it's interesting because it's all about technology and the mechanics technology, how it tries to expand and evolve from the limitations of its design. Which is wonderful when these characters are trying to work through their own crises. Of course they're all very kind of bland and there's no warmth to it and it's very cold as if they want to be 2001 but they don't have the script for it. And then it goes really weird, it's like they're, they're taking the end of 2001 and trying to make it like an hour long. And they have this ship slowly moving through this weird landscape. It's no sane person would make this film, but Star Wars was such a hit they threw money at it and just gave them a fortune to make this film without having the right script for it. And it's wonderful because it's just this paceless mess that I adore. I'd have to watch it right now. I've seen this film way too many times. I've seen all of these films way too many times. I'm not going to lie, even the bad ones I've seen way too many times. And I feel no shame. Okay, um, next we've got Highlander 2, the Renegade Cut. There's Highlander 2 The Quickening, which is the original theatrical release that was butchered. Then Russell McKay, who directed it, come back and did a director's cut. Now, you got to say Russell McKay is probably the dodgiest career on this list, because every other director on this list is a... Like, done genuinely great films. He hasn't. He's done, um, you know, Highlander and The Shadow. But they're competent films, so I'm going to them on the list. But Highlander 2 is a wonderful mess. It's make, and no matter what version you've got of it, it doesn't make any sense. They, in the direct, in the original cut, the, the, it turns out the Highlanders are aliens from another planet who have been banished to Earth. In the director's cut, they think they, they come from the past or the future and are sent. It's a time travel thing, which actually works a lot better. Actually, it makes more sense when you see it in the film. The film makes no sense. Even the Renegade cut, which is longer, and it puts scenes back in, and they have scenes that actually, because in the theatrical cut, there have actually some scenes that come from two different scenes that are intercut that, that make you wonder where am I? And this one they cut them back up and put them in the right place. But it's still a wonderful mess. It's a mess. It's a total mess. It makes no sense. And Sean Connery's awful on it. He's embarrassed in it. And it's wonderful to watch him embarrass himself so badly. And Christopher Lambert doesn't have the greatest range as an actor, but he's a lot of fun in this one. And the whole thing is a total mess. It's utterly, utterly wretched. It's wretched as hell. Try and see it. It's the very good cut is worth seeing. It's it's still bonkers, but it makes more sense. But Highlander 2 in any form is worth seeing just to experience it. It's kind of like the heretic in that, fact, that way. It's like someone wrote this film and thought it would work. It's that kind of level of what the hell. But I, I, can't, I can't not recommend it. <laughs> okay, we're going back to more the movie brat. We've got one from The Heart in New York, New York. Both, like, one from Coppola, one from Scorsese. Both musicals. Both films that hammered their um, power in Hollywood when they were just right, when they needed the most. Like one from the heart was Coppola after Apocalypse Now. He financed this film himself. It was a massive bomb. And it's, it is, I genuinely love this film. There's lots of flaws in it. I mean, the dialogue is, says what the subject is too much. And the songs kind of that feeling too. And the lead act characters aren't the greatest characters. But the, the style of it is wonderful and the mood of it is wonderful. And I can forgive all those flaws. Because I just enjoy watching it. I just enjoy reading that world. And that weird like Las Vegas that's very different from Showgirls. And that just weirdness to the whole film is... I just think it's wonderful. But it's definitely like, what the hell is this? Because Coppola should have a bit more time in the script. And 
cast it. If you wanted to make a commercial film that would work and connect with people, you should put more time into it and cast it with better known names. But you cast it with unknowns or people who are kind of semi known, like Terry Garvin, Frederick Forrest. And it didn't quite work for the, for the audience. But, but I still like it because he cast those people. It's one of those things is like, yeah, he kind of um, shot himself in the foot in lots of ways, but everything he did to shoot himself in the foot is kind of makes him more endearing to me as a viewer, because I just think one from the hearts of... I thought, when I first saw it, I didn't like it. And then I saw it again, I really appreciated it. It was like, oh, I get it now. And it's just this wonderful mood too. It's not... It's never going to blow you away, but it's still a wonderful little film. And I think it's trouble was it, it was a it was a it was a mega budget wonderful little film, which was a problem. But it's still worth it. I'm glad he made it, even though it, he lost most of his money for a while. Now he's got it back. He's fine. But it's a wonderful. What the hell is that film? Because it's it makes no sense as a this film will do well type of thing. It just doesn't make any sense. It just. I don't think he, he kind of developed, I think he kind of rushed to this one after he'd done the polls now to do something different and he should have, he should have done more work in the writing of it, but I really enjoy it. New York, New York is a, a studio film, this was a, a Warner Bros film, made right about the same time as The Heretic. <laughs> Warner Bros was not having a good time then. This is a, an idea of a musical but trying to do it realistically, the idea of this is kind of what La La Land did years later and actually got a lot of acclaim and money for. This one was Scorsese trying to do it with De Niro and Lisa Minnelli or Liza. And I guess it's another film I really like. I really like New York, New York, but I've no idea why they thought it would make any money because De Niro's character is a total dick throughout it. Again, that's what makes it really good. He is a psychopath. He is totally committed to his, his work in a way that's utterly brutal to any other person. It's like, how is anyone going to like him? He's like a character where basically I like the product of what he does but I don't want to see him at all. He's that kind of character. And putting him in the middle of a romantic comedy it was also a musical with Liza Minnelli who is being a sympathetic character makes it really one-sided like you know it's whose fault it's his fault. <laughs> it's not even a or well, it's fault on both sides not he's a dick. <laughs> he's awful. And that's the, the, that's the what, what the hell is this thing about it? It's like, he's so obnoxious in this film. It's like, what were they thinking? How would they think this would ever work as a, for a mass audience? It's like, it's like, I'm going to punch you in the face and just give me your money. I'm going to punch you in the face and give me your money until we get our money back for the film. He might seduce an audience, because he didn't have a clue how to seduce an audience in this time. He was just beating the crap out of them <laughs> for like two hours in this film. It was... Utterly insane watching and thinking, they thought they were going to make money off this? Like, what? What was, what were they thinking? This is strange. <laughs> it's, it is strange, it's just really strange. I don't know what they were thinking. But that's nothing compared to what happened to this one. Popeye by Robert Altman. Yes, Popeye. Someone thought giving Robert Altman Popeye was a good idea. This was uh, not a success. This was not a big success at all. This was a massive bomb. From Disney, no less. I think Paramount did, it, did it put money in as well. I think it was a joint effort. And you watch the film and you're thinking, some of Robin Williams' film, but this is a much better one than Hook. And you're watching thinking, what was anyone thinking? This, this, there's no jokes here. There's no nothing. It's an atmospheric film about Popeye wandering around this town, getting hijinks, but nothing really interesting happens. Which is what I like about it, it's an atmosphere film, it's just a character thing that Rob Altman does with most of his films. But they had him do it for Popeye and it was like, well, what did you expect was going to happen when you gave him this film? It's, it's probably one of the best films in this list actually, it really is, it's wonderful but it's so uncommercial, it's, like, it's just almost like flushing all your money down the toilet. You know, there's no way this film would ever make money, but they gave him the money and it's Wonderful, but it's one of those films that's barely ever released. It's like, we'll give it a token DVD release, fine, just shove about it. And it's like, just give it a Blu ray now. I want a Blu ray of this film, I really do. It's it's wonderful, it's just wonderful, but it's it's paceless. There's no story, there's no nothing. It's just sitting and enjoying 
these weird characters interact for two hours. There you go. Okay, next is Jupiter Ascending by the Pachowskis. I like the Pachowskis a lot, but they are very strange. They are probably the most strange directors on this list for doing other stuff outside the list. That there was always, always some borderline cases like, well, they did Matrix and so that's a bit more mainstream, it made money, so it's respected. But they also sort of done stuff like Cloud Atlas and Speed Racer, which I adore, but it's, it's not the most mainstream stuff. But I thought I want, want this on the list, so I'm putting it on anyway. Because Jupiter Ascending's a bloody mess, and I love it. It's The design's beautiful throughout. It's I'm not even trying to explain the plot, it's all about DNA and class and sci fi movie and the whole idea of some girl who comes from the lower class earth who, has, who ends up having the the rights to uh, lots of riches in the universe and how the, these rich people try to stop her through different means. The downside of the film, the film reasons a mess is the lead character is kind of dumb. Like, Mila Kunis plays the lead character and she's kind of stupid. She falls for all these characters trying to manipulate her. And she keeps on being told, don't trust them, she always trusts them, and it's like, Jesus Christ, when are you ever going to learn? You can't trust these people, and she never does seem to learn anything. That's the big downside, I think that's the big problem with the film, is she, the elite character is kind of stupid. But it looks beautiful throughout, like, there's tons of ideas, there's tons of weirdness to it. Shannon Tatum plays as a dog person who's trying to save her through all these adventures. Again, it's one of those films that's not paced that great because it just sort of starts and stops, starts and stops. But there's tons of ideas throughout it and it's really weird and odd and it's wonderful. But the lead character is really stupid. <laughs> and that's the big problem of it. And when you get to the end and you're meant to really care for her, which does she escape, what she do, you don't really care that much because she's a bit dummy. But it looks so great. Plus, Eddie Redmayne as a villain Actually, all the villains are, are fun, but Eddie Redmayne really is a lot of fun. He's just underplaying it and overplaying it. He's overacting while whispering. And he's just weird. And it's wonderful. It's one of those performers that either you love the performance or you hate it. It's so distinctively odd. And all the, all the supporting parts of this film are distinctively odd. This film is so perverted that Sean Bean doesn't die in it. He survives. That's how weird it is. Yeah, Jupiter Ascending. Give it a shot. It's wonderfully odd. It's like it's a film no one's seen would make, and it's a mess. But it's it's wonderful though. It's a wonderful mess. Okay, next we've we've only got two left. Next is Hulk, which I've done a video on before. So I just go back to my back catalogue using my video on Hulk. It's wonderful. Ang Lee made that. Ang Lee's done this this very respectable career going. But he also made Hulk, which has lots of split screens and weirdness, and this he made a film about the Hulk that's about a father and son traumas. The father traumatised the son and caused all these problems for him. And it's like this Greek tragedy with these strange visuals that are very comic booky that always remind you every moment you watch a comic book movie. But there's also these weird Nick Nolte performances really over the top. Eric Banner underplays it. It's just a strange film. It's like Who's this for? Because there's no action for the first hour and a half and then the last like 40 minutes is all action. It's like they, instead of putting, oh there's very little action before that and then suddenly the action explodes. And it's very unbalanced <laughs> as a film. It's not like pacing the action through the film. No, it's just goes repressing, repressing, repressing and boom, explosion of action. And there's no real villain apart from Nick Nolte, but he's not really a villain, he's just an antagonist and he's and you have some sympathy for him up to a point and there's some wonderful moments you see the Hulk's flashbacks as to his childhood and things or Banner's flashbacks and the tragedy that befell his family and stuff there's tons of wonderful moments in it but it's also very very weird so it's wonderful, just try and see it, it's a wonderful film finally it's Big Trouble in Little China which is another borderline case because it's now a well-known, well-loved film. And John Carpenter's made some strange films, but he's also, he's also been making films in the mainstream strange. He's like, he said studio support for stuff like The Thing. He's made very subversive films, but he's also made them for like 
either studios or independent films uh, companies tied to studios. So he's always been within the mainstream. He's just not always successful financially, but he's always made kind of films that have been fin financed and sold to the public through the mainstream means. So that's why I can include him. But Big Trouble Not China, I've just confused the audience and the studio that made it because they didn't get that Kurt Russell's characters are boring. And it's a comedy where the sidekick's a hero. Anyone who's seen Big Trouble Not China knows all this. They all know how wonderfully wacky it is and how weird and... It's a joy to watch. It's a wonderful film. It's a film I'm going to do a video on. So I'm not going to stretch this out. But it is wonderful. It's a wonderful film. It's bizarre and there's lots of weird jokes. It's fast paced. It's fast paced delivery of dialogue. Very thick still dialogue. There are all these kung fu scenes that just jump in from nowhere that confuses the lead Russell's character all the time. He doesn't have a clue. It's just insane. The full film is insane. But it's a wonderfully deranged film that bombed instantly because no one knew how to sell it because no one understood it and now it's like everyone stole from it it's one of those films everyone stole from because it was like it was obviously a film that developed its, its fallen on video that everyone sort of thought oh, I love this film was it released in the cinema because no one ever remembered it being released because it bombed so badly and no one knew how to sell it so it never had a chance but if they'd found a way to sell it it would have been done great it's just that no one had a clue it's a wonderful film, it's really great and it's the ultimate what the hell is this film because not even the people who made it knew how to sell it. Well, I hope you enjoyed this.